Hi everyone, welcome to Legal Limelight. It's good to be back in 2023. Today I have Rosie Burbridge, who is a UK-based attorney at the law firm Gunner Cook. Uh, I love Rosie. She also has a fashion law background like me. I'm really excited to speak with her today. Hey guys, hi champ. Give it one second. I was just messaging Rosie. I think this is her first Instagram live. Hi, Eden. Hey guys, where are you dialing in from? I don't think that's the right phrase anymore. Where are you watching? <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna give it one second. So this is the first one I've done in a while. I think my last legal limelight was in December. Um, I'm really excited. We have a whole roster of lawyers who are coming up. Awesome. Hi, Joshua. I'm in Columbus, Ohio. All right, let me just message Rosie real quick. You know, they make it seem easy, but it's not always easy. She says she's here. Okay, let's see how I can add you, Rosie. I, I don't see you. Mm -hmm. Tell her to check again. Champsley's in Columbus, Columbus, Ohio. Where is everyone else tuning in from? That's the right word, tuning in. Now Rosie's here. Hey, Rosie, I'm going to add you. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi. Excellent. This is my first Instagram live, so I feel like, you know, I figured it's, it's a journey. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really that's why I love Instagram. It's just, you know, it's fun and it's informal and it's it's all good. Once you do it now, you'll you'll never not know how to do it unless they change the app for some reason. Excellent. Well, thank Fingers crossed they don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like you just finally got it. Um, I want to pull up your bio because I gave you a quick intro. Um, I'll repeat for everyone who else, else who just joined. This is Rosie Burbage. She's a UK-based attorney, and she's at the law firm Governor Cook. Clients describe her as efficient and effective at managing complex IP disputes. Rosie constantly provides clear, concise, succinct and commercially minded advice. I can say from my own experience as a client that that is all totally accurate. Others note that Rosie stands out for her exemplary customer service. Not only is she technically excellent, but she is strategic in her approach, incredibly knowledgeable, and her billing is simply perfect. Wow. <laughs> That's what matters, right? <laughs> that is amazing. And your her practice is generally in IP protection, enforcement in the UK and internationally. She's particularly known in relation to trademarks, passing off, copyrights and designs, and for her knowledge of tech, retail and consumer goods. Rosie, I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank you. I'm really, really excited to be here. Oh my gosh. So all of that I love because, and what I love about you is your you're way more than just, you know, um, a, a trademark lawyer or a trademark, what we call in the US, prosecution type lawyer. So can you please tell us a little bit about how your practice has kind of evolved to become this maestro of intellectual property that touches upon various levels of IP? I think I've just been super lucky to work in um, a range of different types of law firms so I trained at a very large law firm and in amongst all that I got to do some secondments um, notably to eBay for six months which was amazing there was a period of time where every time somebody sued eBay in the small claims court they thought they were taking on mighty this large organization but it was me <laughs> as a very junior lawyer um, it's 
it's I can't tell if I'm going in a blur, but um, hopefully you can still hear me. Yes. Um, and, and then I worked at a very international firm called Rouse, which was amazing because it gave me much more of that exposure to different jurisdictions, particularly in Asia. Um, and that's one of the things I think is so great about working in IP is that it is so international and you do get a lot more exposure to different cultures, different ways of working, um, you know, and very different legal systems, but all with the same framework, thanks to the various international treaties, you know, the, there is a lot more consistency. And there's a kind of shared language amongst lawyers um, around the world as a result. Um, and then after my time at, uh, at Rouse, I moved to do much more, I guess, um, fashion work in particular. And around about this time, I was also writing for a popular IP blog called the IP Cats, Cat with a K, um, which it was hugely useful because it forced me to read all of the cases that came up. I mean, obviously I would do that anyway, but it's, um, there's nothing like being forced to read it and then write about it to really get to grips with all of the different decisions that are coming out. Um, and that gave me a really great community as well. It helped me to get to know a lot of different people, um, mostly in the UK, but also across Europe and then obviously, you know, the rest of the world, including the US. Um, and it also meant that I got to, um, I don't know, really get to grips with some more meaty litigation. I suppose I was a bit more senior in my career, so I was given a lot more responsibility and did some really fun cases for clients like Superdry. Um, I guess they were probably the most famous. And then I've also worked for, um, you know, clients like Nintendo on the more gaming side of things, which has been super fun. And me. then off the back of that, I wrote, well, I, I was ballsy enough to pitch my book um, to a publisher, which is European Fashion Law, a practical guide from startup to global success. And I think I really recommend getting a publisher for a book because although self-publishing, like you can make a lot more money from it, there is nothing like having a deadline, like having yeah. signed a contract and committed to writing something to actually get you to, to do it. I know not everyone is, uh, Francesca would obviously just knock it out of the park, no problems, but not everyone is a Francesca. And I, I really found having that structure was like super helpful for me. That is uh, you know, it's, it's so true. And I, as lawyers, I know we're so busy, but I think that that's something, you know, you really set yourself apart. And it was one of the things when I was, um, you know, when Rob or a friend, Rob Hanna connected yeah. us, I saw if you are an expert in an area, like writing a, a book really differentiates you. So What's your advice to lawyers who are thinking about it and not sure? Do you think it's worth it because it's a full-time job in and of itself? I mean, it, it did take a really long, the whole process took about three years from like idea to yeah. having it in the hand. Um, the actual writing probably took about 18 months. Um, and to be honest, it just, it ruined quite a lot of holidays. Um, and I don't know, you kind of, you've just got to be prepared for um, giving up quite a lot of your free time. But I, I mean, I found it really interesting. Um, I probably, I found the editing process less joyful than the writing process, but I think that's quite common. Um, and I definitely found the going through and proofreading. I mean, there was a proofreader from the publisher, but you still, you know, it's going out under your name. You want it to be right. Um, that was quite a pain, but yeah, just, having it in my hand at the end of the day was it made it all worthwhile and exactly as you say I think it's helped to give me um I don't know to, it's a point of differenti differentiation it's given me much deeper understanding of the practice area you know not just of um IP but also of the issues facing the fashion industry as a particular um user of IP and then thinking a bit more broadly because although um I didn't obviously go into the same amount of detail on areas that aren't my precise area of expertise. I did have to get to grips with, you know, things like general contractual considerations, um, a lot of e-commerce things, which obviously there's quite a bit of overlap with IP generally. Um, even things like taxation, not huge amounts of detail, but awareness of the kind of the big picture issues that affect fashion. And I think that's made me a much more effective lawyer in the round because 
I mean, a really large part of our job isn't necessarily knowing the solution to everything, but it's knowing, oh, there is a potential problem here and we need to get somebody in to look at that. And I, I've really found writing a book that focused on a particular segment, a particular group of people, and I suppose was designed to be read by that group of people as opposed to something that is much more um, lawyer focused, which I think, you know, those books are fantastic as well. But I wanted to write something that was maybe a bit more accessible and hopefully more useful for people in industry. And also for people I found as a junior lawyer that nobody really explained how everything joined no. up, you know, like oh. you had to kind of, you just had to learn it yourself. And I wanted to join a few of the puzzle pieces together to make it a bit easier for people. I love that. I think that a lot of lawyers wait until a client pays them to learn something, right? <laughs> or to experience it or wait until it comes across your desk if you're a junior. But you're right. If you have a passion about something, fill in those gaps. Reading all of the cases or even treatises, articles, I usually write something once a year. So um, I, I understand what you're saying, that the process of the researching and the writing, I think actually helps make you a better lawyer because it forces you to do that, all of that digging and getting it in your brain. Exactly. And there's nothing like thinking about how it's applicable to something. Um, you know, that's why obviously doing work for a client, it does sort of register more than if you're writing an essay in a, in a university context because you're thinking about it from a real world perspective and also thinking about the limitations you know what are the things that I cover the sorts of evidence that you can get and there's the, like the dream evidence um, that no client has ever collected in their entire lives and then there's the reality of those sorts of things that you're more likely um, to have maintained but I, I guess I found I wanted to cover off things like employees leaving and, you know, the, the sort of more realistic things that face businesses on a regular basis. Or, or quite often, you know, if it's um, post acquisition, sometimes none of the information is available um, because all of the relevant people have left and all of the documents have been lost somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's great. I really enjoyed that side of things. So we have some questions which we can just get into um champsley has asked how does a law student break into fashion how does a law student break into fashion in the uk i would ask um i mean i don't i think whilst i wrote a book about fashion law the honest reality is that there is no such thing right <laughs> So yeah. there are lawyers who specialize in different areas, you know, and some of them work a lot more with fashion businesses than others. So if you're 100% sure that the only area you want to work in is fashion, then I think getting a job in house in a fashion business is probably the best route to doing that. And often that means starting off as a paralegal and then working your way up and, and getting a variety of experience. And that, that that's probably you know the easiest i wouldn't necessarily say it's easy but that's probably the most sort of straightforward and quick route in but if you're not 100 percent sure that that is the industry that you want to work in forever i think there's a lot to be said for um you know maybe even doing that paralegal background experience when you're not committing to a particular routes you know quite early on and then thinking about starting your legal career in a much larger firm where you get to try out different areas and then once you're sort of confident that you, that is what you want to do committing to it because I, I certainly started my career thinking that I wanted to be a media lawyer and although IP is kind of a little bit media adjacent it's not it, it's not exactly what I thought I was going to end up doing um, when I was sort of 21 22 so you know, I think you often have a, a vague idea of what it is, but I know people who started off wanting to do, um, I don't know, they started off wanting to do media law and they end up doing real estate or wills and probate or something that is very, very different, but they just enjoy that, um, they're much smaller pieces of work and much more, I guess, close client connection. And that's what they really loved in their job. So it, it just depends. And I think there's a lot of value in trying to get the experience to support what you think you want to do, but also keeping an open mind and giving yourself opportunities for growth because 
I mean, a lot of the people that I know who work in fashion businesses, quite large fashion businesses, they started off being corporate, you know, M and A lawyers in very large um, multinational firms for several years before focusing on fashion. And I can tell you that they were definitely not doing anything remotely related to fashion. It was, I don't know, petrochemicals or something, like very um, unrelated. But they're learning the skills of the trade as far as. Um, m a finance that sort of thing is concerned i love that uh, I, it's i give a very similar answer when students ask me and i always start with that well you need to understand that there is no such thing as fashion law and you have to decide what area of law do you like do you want to be an ip expert in fashion do you want to be a you know there's import export real estate m a like you said so i think it's very important rather than focus you know, there, there are some people who say, I don't care, I want to do this industry, then, you know, it's it's different. But generally speaking, you know, you went to law school to be a lawyer, if you really, really want to be a good lawyer, regardless, you have to pick the type of law that you want to do. And um, for me, that was intellectual property. And I think now it's changing a little bit where law students can get jobs right in house. That's not, that was not very common, Rosie, like maybe five, 10 years ago, I would say, but I think it's becoming more common. What about in the UK? Can people graduate and just immediately start working for a company? So the really big change in the UK has come in the last year or so where the route to qualification doesn't require a training contract. And typically a training contract was awarded by a law firm, like some in-house jobs would give them, but mostly, um, mostly not. And mostly if you did get a training contract working in-house, you'd have to have worked as a paralegal for quite a long time before. Wow. That. But now, now you can basically use your time working as a paralegal towards qualifying as a lawyer. And I think that's opened up you know, it, the aim of it certainly is to increase access to the profession and to give people who maybe have had a slightly more diverse background for one reason or another, the opportunity to um, to qualify without having to go through quite the same number of hoops. I think in reality, there is still gonna be a slightly two-tiered system between people who train within the law firm model and people who don't, but it has really made it possible in a way that it you know, just wasn't before for people to work as paralegals, potentially in a number of different companies, and then use that collectively, as long as they're getting like the requisite types of experience um, to start their legal career and to, to become a qualified lawyer. So, I, I mean, I still think you're in a much better position if you get the experience of being in a firm, because you do get to try out you know, you're exposed to lots of different types of businesses, lots of different problems, but it's exciting that that is, that is an alternative route. And I, I just, I literally just got off the phone with a, um, an in-house attorney who she's, you know, under two years, right? So she's very junior. It's her first job entry level. And I, I, I sent that to her is, you know, this is now you have to think about the future of your career and the, the ability to learn learn is the number one most important thing so you have to think about if you are going in-house right away if you don't go to a firm right away are you going to be in a group where you're learning will you be under someone will it kind of be almost like an associateship or as if it were a firm where you're going to get that level of training and for a lot of um the people who go right in-house it may not be that which is fine right but then maybe it's something to think about for the next position, um, working under someone and learning and being like an apprentice almost has been the, I think the most important factor in my personal career. I've watched and I've learned because of the people that I've worked for. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, I have to say that there are some, certainly some in-house teams that are much bigger than a lot of um, relatively small law firms. So it is, yeah. um, it does vary uh, quite considerably, particularly if you're taking on a global side of things. And um, one of the big advantages of being in-house is, I mean, typically there is more opportunity for moving between different countries um, and certainly working on more of a global basis more regularly than um, a lot of private practice jobs. I mean, there's, there's, it's a, a 
a kind of continuum. Um, and I think the key is to, like you say, always find something in your job where you have an opportunity to learn. And, you know, even if you're not necessarily doing exactly the sort of law that you want to do, there are ways of writing blogs, like even just sharing content on LinkedIn, like you can still learn about new areas and showcase that expertise if you're not getting that opportunity every single day in your job. Um, I totally agree. LinkedIn's amazing now. LinkedIn just, you don't need an editor. You don't need to get through, you know, get publication approval. It's just you click, you type and you post. <laughs> Exactly. And it's really, it's nice, like much shorter content, um, but much punchy, much more punchy sort of information tends to cut through. Um, I, you know, I really like the combination of being able to put up articles, but also like just a general post can often have a lot of information. Um, and obviously things like Instagram, like that just wasn't even remotely possible. Um, some of us are still getting used to things like Instagram Live. Um, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I think there's a lot more opportunities there than there have been really ever before. It's an exciting time. I, um, I'm going to be talking about it a lot this year is the integration of tech into the practice and AI, which I feel that, you know, if the metaverse and Web3 was last year, I think this is the year of AI that we're starting to actually see it like hit consumers. Um, so it's very interesting but on a general level the whole practice is changing in the way we network the way we meet so i'm i'm really excited i'm very glad that you um came on today and it's great to see you know even traditional firms embrace this and i know you're at the forefront right now in all things which is awesome rosie so thank you for coming on no thanks so much for having me it's really really great um, I have to say, like, one of the great joys is that we, I feel like I know you very well, but we've never actually met in reality. <laughs> no. And then when I meet people in person, it's like, oh, okay, you know, we, it's, it's funny. It's, it's funny, but think, you know, thankfully we're able to, you know, build real relationships through, through social media. You have to be more intentional about it, but yeah. I you know, I think that's important is like actually using the tech, not just to hide behind a screen, but really to like use it to extend your personality and connect with people. 100%. Excellent. Okay, Rosie, well, what's the best way that people can get in touch with you? Um, you know, you are one of the top IP lawyers in the UK that also manage global work. So if someone wants to work with you, what's the best way for them to reach you? Um, well, I don't limit myself to one way. Uh, I would guess my email is probably the quickest way to get hold of me, which is just rosie.burbage at gunnacook.com. But then I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn and also my website, which is very imaginatively titled rosieburbage.com. Um, like you can obviously, my email address is all over that. And also you can sign up to my amazing newsletter, which it is, Francesca, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> We try to, I try to make it, um, I don't know, cover as many quirky and genuinely useful decisions as possible. So the next edition is coming out fairly soon. We're going to cover everything from Sussex wine, um, getting a protected designation of origin through to some slightly more potentially relevant trademark cases. <laughs> so amazing. I can't wait to read it. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you again, Rosie. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I, we are here every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And have an amazing